Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when the stone was rolled away? Were you there when the stone was rolled away? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the stone was rolled away? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when he rose up from the grave? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Take your Bible this morning. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 22. I just had that song on my heart this morning. Just kept, I was studying for this message, and it just kept ringing in my brain. So I thought, you know what? I want to sing it. Amen. Luke 22, Luke 22, verses 7 through 13, verses 7 through 13, chapter Luke, I can't talk. Y'all going to pray for me, my tongue went crazy. Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 13. Amen. Let's read. The Bible says, Luke 22, 7 through 13. Amen. Let's read. The Bible says, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man, good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. 
And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. I want you to turn one other place. I want you to turn this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Let's read that together. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Second, find that. First Corinthians chapter five and verse seven. The Bible says, "Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed." For us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, Lord, we come before your throne this morning. Lord God, we come, Lord, on behalf of that one that may be listening to us, Lord, that's undone in their sin. Father God, we all need to hear that old story again and again, Lord. It's never old. It never gets dull in our hearing. But Father, we plead with you on behalf of souls. Lord, we plead with you, Lord, on behalf of those who are in darkness and cannot see that Christ is the light, those who are, who are wandering in their own way, trying to find meaning in this life, trying to find peace in this life, and finding none, though they've turned over nearly every stone. Lord God, I pray this morning that, Lord, by whatever, whatever steering and guiding of your will, Lord, that they've come to hear, the message today, Father, I pray that you would open their understanding, that they would see Christ in all his glory, that they would realize that he is the lamb that was slain for them. Father, I pray today that you might open our understanding. Lord, I pray that, Lord, our human flesh would not impede, Lord, what you want to do in our hearts and minds today. Lord God, I pray that, Lord, this old temple of flesh, Lord, that you dwell in here, Lord, I pray today that it wouldn't stand in your way. Oh, Holy Ghost of God, take control of this vessel. Preach through me, Lord. I pray today that you would magnify Christ above all. Give me your power, and I'll preach your word, Lord. Give me your power. Touch our hearts. Touch our lives. Touch our ears. Make us spirit-filled listeners to receive what you have for us today. And may Christ get the glory. It's in his name we ask, and for his sake, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. title of the message today is this is part 164 of getting to know Jesus. As we're inching closer to Calvary, I was telling my wife this morning before I left, you know, I said, I wish I could just cram it all in before next Sunday, but I can't. So it's not going to fall chronologically, but we are certainly close at this time of year to Calvary. We're very close. Matter of fact, we're, we're, we're now entering into the evening before he was betrayed. and Well, he's already been betrayed, but before he's turned over to the guard. <clears throat> but I don't want to focus on that so much as I do want to focus on this Passover. <clears throat> and, of course, I know... You probably know all this, but we're going to go through it anyway. We're going to rehearse it just for the sake of doing so. Uh, You know, we know the story of, uh, of, of how the children of Israel, the Hebrew children, they wound up in the land of Goshen. And for 400 years they had suffered because there was, there was a new Pharaoh did not know Joseph. And the children of Israel, suffering in captivity under the Egyptians who were afraid because they had, they had multiplied so greatly that they, that, that they could have easily rose up against the Egyptians and, and in their fear of that, they made slaves of them. They used them to build many of their great pyramids and, 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 and different things over there and We know what happened. God sent Moses. God sent Moses and Aaron. And we know the story. You've all heard the story. You know the story backwards and forwards. Nine plagues had been sent upon the land of Egypt as Pharaoh hardened his heart each time. 
but the children of Jacob were spared every single time. God not pouring out his wrath on them, but upon the Egyptians. And Pharaoh still, time and time again, he would almost change his mind, but then he would come back and say, no, I refuse. I won't let you go. But then the tenth plague was coming. And on a spring day, Moses called for a meeting of the elders of the people. And he told them in ten days they were to take a male lamb. It couldn't just be any lamb. It had to be a spotless lamb. And they were to take it and they were to separate it from the other livestock and they were to keep it with them for four days. They were to constantly inspect that lamb to make sure that lamb was pure and spotless. And on the 14th day, they were to kill it. And when they killed that lamb and its blood was spilled, they were to take, they were to take a, 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 a bundle of hyssop, which is, if you've never seen a picture of hyssop, it, it's a long woody stem and it's got little, little leaves and flowers all over it. And they would take a bundle of that and they would take and they would dip that into the blood of that lamb that they'd kept in their home for those 14 days. And they went outside and they went to the, the door frame and they went down the side of the door frame and they took the blood again and they went down this side and they took the blood again and they went across the top of the door frame. And that night, God would pass through Egypt. His death angel would pass through Egypt to take the life of the firstborn of every house. But when he saw the blood there, he would pass over those houses. Everyone that had the blood on the doorpost. And this, 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 this thing was so significant that God commanded the children of Israel to begin the first month of their year at this time. According to Exodus 12, 2, they were to commemorate this in remembrance of the deliverance that God had given them. Now, I want you to look in John chapter 1, if you would. You're, all, you're pretty close to it. It shouldn't take you but a second to flip over there, just a few pages. John chapter 1, in verse 29 John chapter 1 and verse 29, John the Baptist, down by the river Jordan, preparing the way of the Lord, the Bible says that he had already said, you know, there's one coming after me who's latchet of whose shoe I'm not worthy to unloose. Verse 29, the Bible says the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest unto Israel. Behold, therefore I am come, I'm sorry, therefore I am come baptizing with water. Now, I want you to look on down verse 36. A day later, the Bible says on verse 35, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, and notice the exclamation point, Behold, the Lamb of God! You see, he recognized it the day before. But today, he's proclaiming him as his Lamb. Amen? I believe that was the moment when John the Baptist, when it all clicked the day before, and he realized the whole picture. And he calls him the Lamb of God. And that's who Jesus is. Amen? He is that Lamb of God. <clears throat> you know, speaking of him as the Lamb of God, I want to give you three thoughts this morning on that, that he is the Passover Lamb. Christ is our Passover, amen? It's because of him. That's what our text said this morning there in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, Jesus and his disciples were about to go and, and sit down one last time together. 
in this meal which pictured which pictured what he was about to do, that he was about to be sacrificed. Let me say to you, first of all, that he is God's lamb. Amen? He is the lamb of God, and he is sanctified. Amen? As God's lamb, which means he was set apart. He is the lamb. They were to take a lamb, like we just said, and set it apart and, 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 go, and, and go over it and, and, and comb through its its wool, and and look and see if there was anything in it, anything in the skin, any break in the skin, any 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 scabs, any 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 place where it was maimed, anything anything would cause that lamb to not be considered for a Passover lamb. Any fault, any flaw in it. And as we talked about uh, time and time again, how Jesus in the temple was examined again and again and again by the scribes and, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the chief priests and the elders, all of them, they all examined him over and over and over. They couldn't find one thing really to accuse him of. They couldn't find a thing. They, they tried, but they couldn't. They couldn't find a spot nor a stain in him. <clears throat> Again, the lamb that the children of Israel selected, it was to be dedicated to God. It was separated from all the other animals. It was special. And they were to take care of it for those four days. And then it was to be given to God. It was the Lord's Passover. Exodus twelve eleven. the Bible says, And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Again, the Lord was going to take them and lead them out of Egypt, which is a picture of sin, which is a picture of the world, and He was going to take them out of there and deliver them from it. Such a beautiful picture of salvation in the Passover. But Jesus... Jesus is God's dedicated lamb. Why? Because he's the only begotten of the Father. Amen? John 1.14 tells us, said, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Christ, oh, we know, he came into this world to not, not for his own glory, not for anything of that nature, but, but for to bring us into the glory of God, to deliver us from the curse of sin, and to bring us into the presence of God Almighty. 1 John 4, 9 said, it was, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. God sent Him with that one purpose, which was to, to, save, he was to, he was to save us from the curse of sin, just like, those, just like those Hebrew children were saved from the death angel that passed through. You and I, with the blood of Christ, are saved from the curse of sin and from the penalty of sin. He was a sanctified lamb. Why? He fully dedicated himself to doing God's will. Never one time did Jesus fail to do exactly what God the Father wanted him to do. Not once. He said, I can of, own my, I can, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Christ didn't come down to do his own thing. No. He had one singular purpose, and that was to follow the Father's will explicitly. Amen? You know what? You and I have one purpose, too, and that's to follow the Father's will. Amen? That's why we're here. We're to follow, you say, we're, we're to follow in Christ's footsteps. That's right. And in, in doing that, that's following God's will. Amen? He said, all, I'm sorry, he said, and he that sent me is with me, in John 8, 29, and the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. 
I said he's the only begotten of the Father, and he's full, he was fully dedicated to doing the Father's will. <clears throat> and because he fully dedicated himself to the salvation of men, his whole purpose of life was to die. He said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.15, he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And I, and I want to say this morning to those who are out there listening to me, and I say that to those who are listening to me only because according, according to, to what I know of those in this room, you're saved, according to your testimony. But I say to those out there who are listening to me, there's not a single one who has gone too far that the blood of Jesus cannot reach you. Not one. Amen. Paul said, he said, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm going to tell you, every single sinner who's ever came through the blood of Jesus Christ feels the same way. I don't know how in the world he saved me as bad as I was. I, just, I still, to this day, am amazed that he would save me. No, because I know me, and he knows me. But in spite of me, the Bible says, you know, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though... Even though we were wicked, even though we were vile in sin, he still loved us in spite of that. Thank God he was sanctified to be God's lamb. He's always been God's lamb. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was also a sinless lamb. He was without spot. You know, as I said before, that lamb, <clears throat> that lamb was to be without any blemish at all. Perfect. I'll tell you something else about that lamb. That lamb was to be a one-year-old lamb. It could, they, they didn't take a little, a little baby lamb. They didn't take an old, long-in-the-tooth lamb. They took a one-year-old lamb. It was full-grown, full maturity, full strength. Christ didn't die as a teenager. Christ didn't die as an old man. Christ died at 33 and a half years of age, right in the prime of his life. Amen? Just as the lamb that was slain was at the prime of it. If you want to look over in Leviticus chapter 22, we could real quick. It won't take but a second to turn there. Leviticus chapter 22. If you can find that. Amen? Genesis, Exodus, and then Leviticus. But in Leviticus 22, verse 22 through 24, you see the requirements. The Bible says, Blind or broken, or maimed, or having a win. I bet you don't know what a win is. That's a, that's a running sore. Or scurvy, that's an itchy place. Or scabbed, ye shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering of, by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. Either a bullock or a lamb that hath anything superfluous or lacking in his parts, that mayest, that mayest thou offer for a freewill offering, but for a vow it shall not be accepted. Ye shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised or crushed or broken or cut, neither shall you make any offering therefore in your land. It had to be perfect. Not close, not good enough, but perfect. And Jesus was perfect, without blemish. Not one time. Not one time was the devil able to tempt Jesus to sin. Not one time was man able to draw Jesus into sin. Not one time did anger cause Jesus to sin. Not one time did Jesus' earthly tabernacle cause Jesus to sin because Jesus had no sin in him. He did not come through the male bloodline of man. No, he was the seed of God, the seed of the Holy Ghost. Perfect in all his ways. Hebrews 
For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Oh, that lamb was to bear. He was to bear the price. He was sacrificed on the behalf of the children of Israel for that family. And Jesus Christ, he was the sacrifice for me. As we talked about in Sunday school, I feel like I'm just re- reliving what we just went through in Sunday school. But that's okay, amen? Listen, I don't think we can ever exhaust the subject. Amen? As, we talked, as he talked about earlier about that crown of thorns, and thorns, of course, represent the curse of man. Listen, he took it all on himself. God put all of it on Jesus so that he didn't have to put any of it on me. He didn't have to put any of it on you. Oh, the devil, the devil, he may come to you and he may say, well, you know, he paid for some of it, but what about since then and all that? Listen, Christ paid for all of it. Amen? Somebody, I've had people argue with me. I've been out trying to lead people to Jesus. Say, yeah, well, well, what about how, what happens when you, what happens after you get saved and then you sin? Well, you know, what about all that? And I like to throw this back at them. How old were you when Jesus died? Oh, I wasn't born yet. So then you're trying to tell me that all your sins had to be in the future then. All of them. Amen? When he died, all your sins were in the future. Yeah. He died for all of them. The ones I hadn't committed yet? Yeah. And some might say, well, well then I, I guess I can just sin all I want to then. You know my response to that? I do. I sin more than I want to. I don't want to sin. When you're saved, <laughs> you don't want to sin. Amen? I, I take somebody and say, well, I just do whatever I want to, and I just let I sin all. They don't know Christ. You don't take and rub Christ's face in your sin. <clears throat> It'll break you down when you realize what you've done. It'll cause you to mourn when you realize what you've done. Listen, what he suffered for me is enough to make me, as I sang, tremble inside. When I realized what Christ did for me because of my sin, that was my sin that was on him. That was my sin that caused his flesh to be torn in ribbons. It was my flesh, it was my sin that, that caused his bones to be able to be seen. It was my sin that caused that, that crown of thorns to be to, to be pressed down upon his head. It was my sin that drove those nails through his hands and his feet. It was my sin that mocked him. I have nothing to brag on except for what he did for me. Oh, he was perfect, sinless. 1 Peter 2.22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And because he had no sin of his own, he could bear our sins, all the sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Somebody might look and say, well, it was terrible what they did to that little lamb. It was terrible for them to for them to to to, to kill that little lamb to, to slice its throat and and, 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 and and take its 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 innards out and roast it with fire. It's terrible as they did that to that poor little creature. But you see that had to happen. The blood had to be shed. Blood had to be applied. But all the blood of all the lambs, all the bulls, all the, the, the he goats, all the turtle doves, they couldn't take it away. All it could do was cover it. Christ came and he took it. The writer of Hebrews says that Christ's innocence allowed him to bear the sins of the guilty. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Oh, he's coming back. And when he comes back, amen. Hey, listen, and I'm changed. 
There won't be any more of this. Won't be any more of this sin in my life. Oh, no. Won't be any more of that wrestling with the flesh, thank God. Oh, I'll be free then. I said he was sanctified. Not only that, as a lamb, he was, a, he was, he was sinless and without spot. Thirdly, let me say to you, he was the sacrifice. The children of Israel were to take and, and, and to kill that lamb in their house. Again, as a sacrifice to God. They were to roast that lamb whole over the fire. And they were to eat that lamb. They weren't to break any of the bones. The bones were to remain intact. You say, I wonder why that was. Well, when Jesus was on the cross, you know, they, they commonly broke their legs. They didn't break any, any of his because he was God's lamb. Whatever was left over, they were to burn to ashes. There was to be nothing left of the lamb on the next day. They were to eat that lamb and get rid of everything that was left. <clears throat> you say, what does that tell you? That tells me you can't partly take Jesus. <laughs> say, I'll have a little Jesus and a little bit of works. No, it doesn't work that way. You take him all. Amen? I think about the manna, the bread of life. Amen? The bread from heaven. They weren't to keep it over to the next day. Amen? You get it all. Jesus told them, he said, you know, he said, you got to drink of my, you got to drink of my blood and eat of my flesh. Amen? They didn't understand that. He said, you got to have me. You got to have all of me. He's our perfect sacrifice. He sacrificed, Christ sacrificed everything. He sacrificed everything. His station. You say, what do you mean? Well, where did he come from? Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. You go from being in heaven, in the glory of heaven, in the presence of the Father, to take off the robe of glory and to come down and be born in a, in a cattle trough to grow up in poverty. Took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He sacrificed and left heaven and came here for us. He sacrificed, not only that, he, in his earthly life, he sacrificed his livelihood. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Christ, Christ worked as a carpenter as a boy growing up in Joseph's house. Joseph was a carpenter. I mean, Matthew 13, 55, they said, is this not the carpenter's son? They knew him as the carpenter's son. No doubt Jesus had toted lumber and, and probably hammers and, and saws and chisels and, and, and worked alongside Joseph. And, 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 and I, I, when I see Jesus, I don't picture skinny little weak Jesus. I picture Jesus being a man. I picture him being a man's man. I picture Jesus, uh, you know, with, with, with muscles. I mean, he was a, he was a construction worker. Amen? I mean, up until the time when he started his ministry, he was a construction worker. Amen. I, I mean, I believe, I believe if you, if we were to, if we were to somehow go back in, in in time and see Jesus before before all this, we'd see we'd see him. He, I mean, he was perfect in every way. Amen. I mean, again, he was he was he was full grown. He was at the at the peak of his manhood. I mean, his his. I'm sure his his. His, his body was as, was as solid as a man's body can be. His eyes as clear as, as an eye can be. His mind is, sh is sharper than any mind around him. He was a perfect, full-grown man. He sacrificed. He sacrificed everything. And he asked others to sacrifice their livelihood. In Matthew 4, 19, he said unto them, Follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Leave the boats. Let's go catch men. And he calls us to, to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. He didn't live a life of luxury. No. He lived a life, he lived a life of poverty. The foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, Matthew eight twenty tells us. Not only did he sacrifice his livelihood, but he sacrificed his very life. 
John twelve thirty two and 33, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Hebrews seven twenty six and 27 says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then from the people's, but this he did once when he offered up himself. Oh, what a sacrifice we have. And that brings me to number four, which is salvation. He is the lamb that was slain, that provided salvation. Amen? That lamb back then provided salvation from the death angel that was to come through so that they didn't wake up the next morning with their firstborn dead. Oh, no! That, 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 was, that was provided, that lamb provided salvation for them in that regard, but not eternal salvation. No, that came through Christ. That came through Him alone. Again, God was going to take the life of all the firstborn, and there was only one way that the Israelites could prevent that death from entering their house. Again, they had to take that blood from the lamb that was slain and put it over and around the doorways. But the question is this. The door, was there some power in the door? Was there power in the doorway? I mean, was I don't believe there was any power in the doorway. That just represented the home. Was there power to save in that hyssop brush whereby the blood was applied to the door? I don't believe so at all. No power in that hyssop. It was just the instrument used. Was the power to save in the man's work of taking the blood and dipping, uh, taking the hyssop, dipping it in the blood and applying it to the door? Was there some uh, some salvation, some power to save in that? Of course not. Ephesians two eight says, "For by grace are you saved through faith." It was in believing. If I do as God tells me, God is going to pass by. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No, the power was in the blood. But if the blood was not applied, then it would have done no good whatsoever. In Exodus twelve thirteen, God said, When I see the blood, as we sang this morning, I'll pass over you. Death visited every house that the blood was not applied. And every mother woke up to scream when it found her, found her firstborn dead. <clears throat> Jesus is the only way to salvation. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That the is so important. He's the genuine article. Amen. There have been a many, oh, there's been, there's been millions of lambs slain. Many of them roasted over the fire. Many of them eaten by the Jewish people. There's only one lamb that takes away the sins of the world. The power of Christ's salvation is in his blood. Jesus said, for this is my, is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You see, our sin, what it earns us, it earns us eternal death. That's what we deserve. We deserve to be punished forever in the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. Well, that's what we deserve. Every single one of us, under the sound of my voice, if we got what we really, truly deserve, we would never stop suffering. But because of the love of God, He sent His Son, the sinless, perfect, spotless Lamb, 
And he poured his blood out on that cross of Calvary. And if that blood is applied, you say, when did you get your blood applied? November the 1st, 1975. In my bedroom, sitting next to my mom, I got the blood applied. And because that blood's been applied, the devil can't do a thing about it. The devil can't have me. Amen? Hell has no right to me whatsoever because of what Christ has done. Amen? When God sees the blood of Christ, God has to pass over. He can't, listen, he can't, he can't hold me accountable because my sins are not on me anymore. My sins were put on the Lamb. Amen? My sins were put on my Lamb. Sacrifice for me. And just as the blood that night wouldn't help them if they didn't apply it, they could have killed the lamb, they could have eaten the lamb, they could have done everything like they were supposed to, made the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs and all the things that they ate, and they could have done all that. But if the blood wasn't applied, it didn't matter. And people can come to church, they can, they can, they can sit and they can, they can smile and they can sing together and, 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 and be friends and hang out and do all the things that church members do together. And you know what? People can sit, and they do sit, year after month after month, year after year, lost as they can be on a church pew. Without the blood being applied, there is no salvation. We have to apply it. And I say that this morning, believing that out there somewhere, there's somebody listening. Christ, is the sacrifice for sin. And by looking to him, by, ta- by, by faith, saying, saying, God, I know that I have sinned against you. I have broken your law. I have sinned against you and you only, and I need the blood of Jesus Christ to be applied on my life. And I come to you, and I believe that he is the Lamb of God. I believe that he is the sacrifice for my sin. And I ask you by faith, to wash me in that blood. And my friend, if that's if you've done that, praise God, God doesn't see you sin anymore. And if you haven't done that, I urge you to, don't spend one more moment, don't risk one more moment without that blood. Come to Him. Believe on Him. And be saved. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song of invitation, 383, 383. If you, if you just want to come and pray for somebody, if you need to come and, and pray for yourself or whatever your need is this morning, I urge you to come. We're going to sing 383, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I want to sing that last verse. And when before the throne I stand in Him complete, Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin 
and had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Well, praise God. I'm so glad Jesus did it. Amen. I'm so glad that that, that burden isn't on me anymore. Thank God. Free, free, free from this world of sin. Amen. Washed in the blood of Jesus, I've been born again. Amen. I may bust out the song. <laughs> Amen.